This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Learning from Ferguson by Peter Gelderloos Part 1. The Nature of Police, the Role of the Left A young black person was killed. Many people brave enough to take to the streets in the aftermath were injured and arrested. And the only real consequences the police will face will be the changes designed to increase their efficiency at spinning the news or handling the crowds the next time they kill someone. Because amidst all the inane controversies, that is one fact that no one can dispute. The police will kill again and again and again. A disproportionate number of their targets will be young people of color and transgender people. But they have also killed older people like John T. Williams, Bernard Monroe, and John Adams, and white people too. The right has seized on a couple cases of white youth being killed by cops, like Dylan Taylor or Joseph Jennings, throwing questions of proportion out the window in a crass attempt to claim the police are not racist. Essentially, the point being made by right-wing pundits is that the cops are killing everybody, so it's not a problem. The fact that they can make this argument and still retain credibility with a large sector of the population shows how normalized the role of the police is in our society. The true meaning of the evidence used manipulatively by the right is that the police are a danger to anyone not wearing a business suit. In a serious debate, however, it would be hard to deny that the police are a racist institution par excellence. They kill young black, Latino, and native people at a disproportionately higher rate than white youth, and the institution itself descended from the patrols created to capture fugitive slaves in the South and police urban immigrants in the North, as masterfully documented in Christian Williams' landmark book, Our Enemies in Blue. What's more, the criminal justice system that the police play an integral role in, both feeding and defending the prison industrial complex, grew directly out of the 13th Amendment's approval of slavery in the case of imprisonment, illuminating the path by which the United States' advancing economy could leave plantation slavery behind, first with the pairing of sharecropping and chain gangs, and more recently with the pairing of a precarious labor market on the outside and booming prison industries on the inside. However, though the police do not affect everyone equally, they do affect all of us. Everyone who is not wealthy can be a target for police violence, and anyone who fights for a freer, fairer world puts themselves directly into the cops' crosshairs. During the Oscar Grant riots in Oakland, or the John T. Williams protests in Seattle, many journalists closely echoed by progressive spokespersons, denounced the white people who took to the streets angered by police killings. With an underhanded racism, they cast white anarchists as the ringleaders of the mayhem, silencing the anarchists of color, as well as the many young people of color without any visible ideology, who were often the most active at taking over the streets or fighting back against the police. If they really cared about racism and police violence, wouldn't they have portrayed the young people of color as protagonists rather than mindless stooges of white anarchists, or simply erasing their participation entirely? Instead of discrediting the relatively few white people who did take to the streets, shouldn't the criticisms have been directed at all the white people who stayed home? However, with the protests after the non-indictment of Darren Wilson, certain entrenched dynamics have started to change. True, the response to the killing of Oscar Grant did spread to other parts of the West Coast, and it was not successfully spun as an issue only affecting black people. But to a far greater degree, the response to the official announcement that the government approved of Michael Brown's murder spread across the country and included people of all races. This is a good thing. More people are taking the problem of the police seriously, realizing they need to react and exploring actions that they can take that will make a difference. The circumstances that force this necessary step forward are tragic, but they are hardly a surprise to anyone with the slightest sense of history. 
Police killings and unwavering government support for the cops are an integral part of our society. They are not going away anytime soon. Logically, people would debate, what is to be done? However, this is a debate that mainstream journalists, progressive journalists, protest organizations, and left-wing figureheads have all studiously avoided, maintaining not so much a conspiracy of silence as one of vitriol and marginalization against anyone who challenges their unspoken tenets. Those tenets are simple. All responses must be peaceful, and the only conceivable goal is piecemeal reform. Within this artificially fixed arena, we are allowed to squabble over all the details we want, from cop cameras to citizen review boards, but we are never allowed to entertain opinions that transgress those limits. Those who use a wider lens to understand where police violence comes from and what role it plays in our society are ignored. If they are employed as journalists or academics, they have just made a poor career move, and they will quickly be drowned out by the ladder-climbing cynical hacks who cover up this ongoing tragedy with banal and myopic observations. Those who actually attempt to explore other paths of action and change will be denounced as thugs, criminals, and agitators. Fox and NPR will speak about them in the same terms. Police and protest leaders will unite to suppress them. That is how free speech works in a democracy. Fix the terms of the debate. Distract the masses with fierce polemics between two acceptable opposites that are so close they are almost touching. Encourage them to take part. And either ignore or criminalize anyone who stakes an independent position, especially one that throws into question the fundamental tenets that are naturalized and reinforced by both sides in the official debate. Noam Chomsky was one of several dissidents to reveal this dynamic during the Vietnam War and demonstrate the unanimity of hawk and dove positions in media debates. The media follow the same rules today. In that earlier crisis, the fundamental tenet was that the U.S. government has the right to project its power, militarily or otherwise, across the entire planet. In the current crisis, the unquestionable dogma is that the police have a right to exist, that the police as an institution are an apt instrument to protect us and serve us and therefore they are a legitimate presence on our streets and in our neighborhoods. In this debate, the right claim that the police are working just fine, while the left claim that changes are needed to get them working better. Both of them are united in preserving the role of police and keeping real people, neighborhoods, communities, and all the individuals affected by police, from becoming the protagonists in the conflicts that affect us. Similarly, we frequently hear leftists claim that the prisons aren't working, exhibiting a willful ignorance as to the actual purpose of prisons. Sadly, for all their distortions and manipulations, the right is being more honest. The police and the prisons both are working just fine. As per their design, they are working against us. On the left, we find a tragic mixture of the unconscionably cynical with the hopelessly naive. No serious person can claim that any of their proposed reforms will make a real difference. And in fact, most have already been tried. Racial sensitivity training only makes the cops better at hiding their racism. It certainly doesn't touch the underlying hierarchies that police serve to protect. Civilian oversight, at the very best, can lead to a few bad apples being forced to resign and they have rarely even reached that level of potency. No matter, bureaucracies have always known how to make individual personnel expendable so as to protect the greater power structure. And no government in the world has given oversight boards more power than the institutions they are supposed to monitor. Not when those institutions are vital to the smooth functioning of authority. As for cameras, they would only increase the power of police by augmenting the intrusion of government surveillance into our lives. The murders of Eric Garner and Oscar Grant were caught on tape, and nothing changed. The fact of the matter is, the vast majority of murders carried out by cops are perfectly legal. How can this come as a surprise? The same people who benefit from police violence are the ones writing the laws or getting the lawmakers elected. 
the only real victim of cop cameras would be people who choose to defend themselves against cops, an action that, no matter how justified, is never legal. If the cops wore cameras, anyone who raised their hand against them would be caught on tape. But the reformers aren't thinking about self-defense, are they? And this is the crux of the issue. The question of self-defense against the police is one that we are not allowed to consider, yet it is the only one that makes sense. The police do not exist to protect society from generalized cannibalism and mayhem, as in some paranoid Batman fantasy. They exist to protect the haves from the have-nots, to maintain the state's monopoly on violence, and to make up for our atrophied capacity for conflict resolution, another of the many prerogatives the state has stolen from us, whether it's the lack of the ability to knock on our neighbor's door when they play their music too loud, or to draw on a wider network of family and community ties to deal with an abusive relationship. We can ignore the antagonistic relationship that the police have with anyone who is not trying or not able to make it to the highest tiers of society. But what we cannot do is reform that relationship away. This is why it is necessary to talk about self-defense against the police. But we are not dealing with an open debate between two equal positions, reform or fight back. First of all, this is because the reformers consistently join in with all the dominant institutions, including the bloody-handed cops they claim to oppose, to silence, marginalize, criminalize, or demonize anyone who chooses to fight back against the police. They do not engage in debate because they could only lose. Instead, they make use of all the lies, distortions, and the generalized amnesia perpetuated by the media specifically to avoid a debate. Secondly, the reformers are parasites. They would not exist without those who fight back. No one outside their respective communities would ever have heard about Oscar Grant or Michael Brown were it not for the rioters. The recent nationwide protests were only possible because folks in Ferguson were setting fires, looting, throwing rocks and molotovs, and shooting at cops for 10 days in August. If the reformers were sincere, they would thank those who took to the streets for bringing the problem to the country's attention then respectfully differ on the chosen tactics and goals, laying out a historical case for why peaceful tactics and reformist goals are better suited for achieving a real change. But this couldn't be further from their actual MO. From parasitic celebrities like Jesse Jackson to an alphabet soup of NGOs, the leftists fly in, put themselves at the head of something they did not start, and work hand-in-hand -hand with the police to try and calm things down. These professional activists don't have a program of their own. They are just professional fire extinguishers. And in the case of Ferguson, they are the government's most valuable tool. Because it wasn't the police or even the National Guard who succeeded in putting an end to the rioting, but these professional activists. Their cynicism goes beyond the parasitical, backstabbing relationship they have with those who actually risk themselves fighting to eject police from their neighborhoods, and beyond their racist portrayal of local people of color who are at the front lines of the fight as either thugs or the unwitting pawns of outside agitators. They will even go so far as to use the families of those murdered by police. In fact, at this point, it seems to be part of their playbook. If the family calls for peaceful protest, as did the families of John T. Williams or Michael Brown, they lay it down like the law and marginalize anyone who tries to respond in a more combative manner, maligning them as being disrespectful to the victim, heartless agitators who are taking advantage of tragedy in order to sow chaos. Yet families are not the only ones with a right to respond to police murders. How many of us would want our parents to write our epitaph? How many of us would trust our friends more than our families to know what we would have wanted if we were killed? Though friendship is not a relationship recognized by law, the friends of a victim have also been directly affected, and they should have a say in what's the appropriate response. In fact, friends and peers have played an important role in many of the anti-police riots in the last few years, 
though their participation has been largely hidden by the media and the pacifists alike. It doesn't end there. Neighbors and witnesses are also traumatized by a police murder. They also have an undeniable need to respond to outrage and reassert control over their environment, a control that walking in a peaceful protest, flanked by cops, cannot give. And if we are not dealing with an isolated murder but a systemic problem, as is the case with police killings, then everyone is affected and everyone has a need to respond. It shouldn't be necessary to point out that this affects all of us. But the pacifying, paralyzing discourse of the reformers specifically breaks down solidarity. Instead of encouraging us all to feel harm done to one another as harm done to ourselves, we are all supposed to take a back seat to what the family wants. The level of hypocrisy is infuriating when you realize that the peace-preaching professional activists don't give a shit for the family of Michael Brown or anyone else murdered by the cops. Family members are just pawns in their agendas. When Durham teenager Jesus Chuy Huerta was shot to death in the back of a police car one year ago, his family rebuffed the police department's hollow gestures of reconciliation, and they did not denounce the people who fought with cops in anger over the killing. It's not a coincidence that local leftists were suddenly silent about what the family wanted. And after the non-indictment, when Michael Brown's stepfather, Luis Head, urged a crowd to burn this motherfucker down, how many reformers decided to actually follow his lead? Instead, they have all scrambled over themselves to prove he did not mean it, broadcasting an apology he issued about a week later a reconciliation that might have been aided by the fact that Head was facing a criminal investigation and had already been demonized in the media for a reaction that, in Ferguson at least, was common sense for thousands of people. This is a fine example of opinions we are not allowed to hold, and how the legal system, the media, and the left all work together to punish and erase such opinions. It was a triumph for this triumvirate of social control that most of the protests around the country were tame, legal affairs that successfully quenched people's anger. But fires, riots, and highway blockades from Oakland to Boston indicate that that control is finally starting to slip. For it to fully fall away, we need to understand the true role of the legal system and the media, and realize the full hypocrisy of the left. It is an alarming but historical moment when the right speaks more truthfully than the left. While the reformers were talking about bad apples and sensitivity training, cops in Missouri hit the nail on the head when they began distributing and wearing bracelets that said, We are all Darren Wilson. Even leftists who did not openly condemn the rioting fell into a tried-and-true holding pattern. The only way they could make the rioting palatable was to talk about police brutality against protesters. In fact, for much of the riots, police in Ferguson were remarkably restrained. It became commonplace for protesters to shoot at police with handguns, and in November, assault rifles even made an appearance. Yet the cops did not shoot back. This is an important step forward. In the face of a police institution that has carte blanche to kill, people are beginning to value their own lives over the laws of the elite. Yet for the reformers who cannot conceive of fully opposing any of the existing institutions, this narrative makes no sense. Normal people can only be victims, never protagonists. And criticizing the police means not talking about those moments when cops are actually scared for their lives, and do not act with total impunity. The lack of strategic thinking is startling. As far as governments go, the U.S. is infamous for being particularly heavy-handed and unrestrained in obliterating resistance. It militarizes its cops. It meets out sentences far longer than what would be considered just in most other countries. And it does not deign to engage in the balances of compromise and social peace like the social democracies do. To surpass the brutality with which the U.S. government liquidated the black and native liberation movements in the 60s and 70s, 
you'd have to look to Iran or China. Yet now, in Ferguson, and in many other cities this past November, the cops and their masters were scared enough that when people began rioting, looting, taking guns to protests, and shutting down highways, the authorities did not respond with a police riot or a military clampdown. To a great extent, their hands were tied. Why? What were they afraid of? It certainly wasn't a peaceful protest or a little bad media coverage. Answering this question more fully and putting the answers into practice is the second step towards ending police violence once and for all. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.